I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Paul D. Miller, also known as DJ Spooky, that subliminal kid. Miller is a composer, multimedia artist, and writer whose work immerses audiences in a blend of genres, global culture, and environmental and social issues. His large-scale multimedia performance pieces include Rebirth of a Nation, Quantopia, and Virtual Antarctica, among others. He is a faculty member of the European Graduate School and provided the soundtrack music for the film Reconstruction, America After the Civil War. His books include Rhythm Science, Sound Unbound, The Book of Ice, and The Imaginary App. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. For more, you can visit his website, djspooky.com, and sign up for his newsletter. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious psychoanalytic perspectives, politics, and poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l your support is greatly appreciated for more information you can also visit my website drvanessasinclair.net or the podcast main website renderingunconscious.org I guess it's always good to start from the beginning. Um, my family, uh, my father, my mother, um, everyone in my you know kind of family backdrop was mostly involved with uh, whether it be literary or visual arts. Uh, my father was dean of Howard University's law school. My mother owned a store called Toasts and Strawberries, which was a uh, very popular store in Washington D.C. Um, and she passed away a little while ago. Uh, so, um, you know, I consider myself a product of a uh, intact uh, African-American uh, progressive uh, family that had an overlap with academia and with the arts. So fast forward to 2020 and uh, who would have guessed I would be a DJ? I, I, I didn't, I wasn't really planning on being a DJ, but um, you know, the world being what it is, hey. Yeah, well, And I saw that you're, I mean, you're doing so many things from your website. There's so much we could talk about, but I think like the Rebirth of a Nation project looks amazing to talk about. And this TED talk that you just did about the 50th anniversary of the internet and Quantopia. I mean, it's all really fascinating stuff. Okay, well, let's talk about that. I'm considering that here we are at the tail end of the Trump administration. In fact, it's a very powerful day. Biden just did his um, inauguration. It's 2.15 here, the inauguration just ended. I was listening to it on headphones while I was walking. Uh, I had to run some errands and I kept hearing, you know, whether it be Lady Gaga or or Garth Brooks singing um, or this or that, Um, Kamala Harris, actually Kamala Kamala Harris um, studied at Howard University where my Mm -hmm. father was Dean of the law school. So it's just a really, I grew up a couple blocks from where the inauguration happens. so it's really, a, today was a very, I felt like this dark cloud had lifted from America and um, the eerie sensibility of how Trump, personally, I never took Trump, I don't take in him or any of his people seriously, nor do I view his followers or these people, they're kind of neuro-linguistic program zombies. So it's kind of, um, you know, the reinforcement comes out of social media. 
So what's fascinating is that um, the internet turned 50 in 2019, as you were saying, and I wrote, I was commissioned to write a composition called Quantopia, which stands for Quantified Utopia. And it was fascinating to see the dystopian aspects, um, whether you look at the like Orwell's 1984 or, or this sheer volume of data surveillance going on, we're in a very intense moment where every aspect of what it, your interior psychology is being kind of uh, quantified and put into these kinds of algorithmic portraits of you that are very eerily um, precise, but also you could see that whole crowd of people was motivated by sort of a post Cambridge Analytica uh, approach to their psychologies. So um, it's very what you call Pavlovian. So to me, at least doing a composition celebrating the 50th anniversary of the internet, you have to be aware of the, the, the eerie sensibilities that linger over the sort of uncanny, considering you're into Freud, the unheimlich approach here, which is the internet has kind of devoured human psychology and turned it into this toxic radioactive cloud that is for people who are, or who are not um, inoculated, considering we're in a pandemic, I consider the internet kind of like enabled a mental pandemic. Um, and Trump is a kind of a mental contagion or a psychological pandemic. Um, so anyway, my, my symphony is kind of part of the antidote or inoculation to that. Um, I consider it about a celebration of information, a celebration of inquiry and a celebration of the complexity that marks um, our contemporary civilization that is now everything that can be digital will be digital. And uh, we have to really think of the future of the 21st century is going to be all about these kinds of weaponized information, regretfully. So um, it's sometimes good to have a little bit of a positive approach. So that's what music is for, at least to me, at least. So yeah, there we go. That's that project. It's called Quantopia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll link to it so that people can check it out. And of course, that's how we got in touch was that I wrote about your work in, in my new book, Scansion and Psychoanalysis and Art, and specifically about remix. I basically just referred everyone to your work to go understand it and to read Sound Unbound um, because it's you, you've already covered the history of it in that way. Would you tell people a little bit about remixes for people who don't know? Sure. Um, you know, a remix plays off of your sense of familiarity with um, a song. So for example, here, I'm gonna shift my, uh, cause this, the afternoon sunlight is coming in um, to my space here. And amazingly enough, there we go. Just wanna move a little higher so I can have better resolution. Um, okay, whenever you hear a song, it leaves a trace of memory. And that memory is kind of uh, an actionable moment in your basic fabric of, of mind, of psyche and so on. So when I was hearing your book about your book, Scansion, to me, what was fascinating was that music itself is kind of an inverse mirror. Um, there's a very famous um, Derridian kind of concept of the tain of the mirror, the thing that holds the mirror together. Um, and what's fascinating about the tain of T-A-I-N of the mirror is that that kind of um, sensibility of inverse reflection is kind of um, a philosophical open sort of uh, text. And where we think about music, it's very specific. Uh, classical music, for example, is based on Greek tuning systems. Greek tuning systems are based on certain mythological and mathematical premises in that culture at the time. Um, and when you listen to Indian music, for example, it's a whole different mythology, a whole different tuning system, and a whole different approach to how art lingers over that culture. So for the 21st century, anything goes. And we're in a con we're in a you know hyper complex situation where memory itself has been, like I said earlier, sort of externalized and uh, arrogated to these devices and to all of the material around us, the cloud. So a remix plays with um, this kind of deconstruction, again going back to both Derrida and to some of the more lyrical implications of um, authors like um, uh, Rodolphe Gachet, who he has a good book called The Tain of the Mirror. So um, I majored in philosophy and did a minor in French literature. So I've always been interested in these kinds of conceptual approach to music. A remix in its simplest form is a permutation of memory. 
Um, so anything goes, you can do mashups, you can do appropriation. Also your book is called The Cut, for example, in DJ culture, cutting and scratching is where you break a song apart into its smaller component elements. When I say break a song apart, one of the easiest ways to hear that is um, some of the scratch routines I would do on albums like uh, the, uh, the Secret Song, which is available on iTunes. You can hear a scratch battle with me and Rob Swift, who's a legendary turntablist. Um, you know, I've also worked on a wide spectrum of appropriation. So a lot of it comes out of African-American appropriation of European uh, hymns, uh, which we then turned into gospel and that was a remix. So if you think about DJ culture, it's still an inheritance of an African-American kind of a psychological tool set of dealing with oppression and of oppression in the face of appropriation. Like African-American identity has been appropriated and monetized, commercialized, everything from TikTok on over to the microblogging platforms like uh, Twitter. It's their kind of an eerie sense of oral culture where people are posting and presenting and doing these smaller takes on things. But that still has the relationship to an African-American impulse of being the subconscious of American uh, discourse. And remixes go straight into that. Probably for some of the audience that might be a little too complicated. So let's just break it down. A remix is if you heard one song and you're like, yeah, I know, okay, that's Kraftwerk or that's the Rolling Stones or Prince. And then I take a beat from another song or I program a beat, mix it in, and you're good to go. Um, and it changes the song immediately. Um, and again, it can go in a lot of different directions, house music, hip hop, techno, dubstep. The logic of collage um, is implicit in DJ culture overall. So mm, that's kind of just like I said, a beginning, but I do want people to remember everything on the internet is a remix. You know, as soon as it's uploaded and put online, people are going to download it, people are going to play with it, people are going to run with it. That that sense of irreverence for the textual authenticity and origination of something, that's a remix. Yeah, and I think that's so important because, you know, I started out, of course, like, well, that, that subliminal kid, right, from William Burroughs. I started out with, like, William Burroughs and Brian Geisen's work, and then it kind of expanded, like, learning about other artists doing cut-ups and collages from there um, until I actually, like, was writing this book maybe five or six years ago, and then I just kind of got completely detoured into just doing cut-ups and collages myself, and then, like, a year ago, I was like, mate, I have to finish that book that I was working on and wrap it up, and now all I care about is doing collages and cut-ups again, but the thing that I think is so important is, like, this whole idea of authorship, and, like, like Burroughs always said that um, all writing is just cut ups of words and that people need to stop worrying so much about like the exact uh, place that this thing started because it's all been cut up and remixed and rehashed and mashed up and there's not going to be any way to figure that out anymore. Yeah, I can see that. But think about the last four years of human life on this planet has been driven by a relentless sense of the way that social media has transformed public discourse. Now, social media is music. To me, at least, there's a kind of a musical component to how we think about social space. Um, so architects um, design physical buildings, musicians design uh, conceptual spaces that are based on patterns in sound. So an, a musician is kind of an architect of the invisible. And what's fascinating about what you were just saying is that every aspect of our contemporary life now has been conditioned by algorithms. And algorithms are simply mathematical patterns that generate predictable outcomes and everything from the recommendation engines on YouTube or TikTok or you name it, part of them are based on what you call the social graph. Um, and we're now in what people are calling the attention economy. So all of these issues, the attention economy basically makes money off of how long you're engaged on that platform. So Mark Zuckerberg gets a nice fat check every year, billions and billions. Uh, Jeff Bezos made, all these billionaires made more money during the pandemic than they ever have before, precisely because people were far more engaged on all these digital platforms. So let's reverse engineer that. Let's think of it as 
you're pulling that narrative apart and seeing what can be done in uh, reverse engineering these patterns. Everything is patterns. Um, so hopefully that kind of goes to the heart of your question. Again, I have a tendency to kind of always think of uh, multidimensionality, multimodality at the core of um, modern life and nothing is simple. I mean, there, there's, it's uh, turtles all the way down, as they say. Yeah, and that, I mean, and that totally reflects the way the unconscious is theorized to kind of be that everything is like more like a web and everything kind of has a lot of different pathways leading to nodal points. And like, for example, in dreams, like the thing that pops up as the image in the dream will have so many different things determining it or so many different scenes or emotions or whatever from your life determining that one scene. It's never so cut and dry as just being like from one direct thing to one direct image. Right. But just imagine that we're in this era where social media and these reflections of the human condition have been put into like kind of a hall of mirrors, like an infinite series of reflections of reflections of reflections. And um, in India, amusingly enough, they came up with the concept of infinity and also invented the concept of zero. And, and amusingly enough, I always chuckle about whenever Westerners are like, what did people of color, it's again, right-wing lunatics here in America, there was one insane Republican sort of QAnon, which is this lunatic uh, cult uh, that comes out of the internet. He was like, what do people of color ever generate for the West? And you're like, numbers, um, you know, that's what we call them Arabic numerals, for example. <laughs> but the Arabs copied it from the Hindus. And again, that's appropriation. It's a remix, which I'm cool with. Uh, the Greeks didn't have zero and nor did the Romans. Um, so people tend to always overlap this kind of implicit bias of thinking of the way a civilization is reflected in the people who believe they've inherited it. So for example, Trump, again, I keep going back to social media because today's a crazy day. It is January 20th, 2021. We no longer have Trump and it ended in a peaceful way. Although two, two weeks ago, there was riots, protests, all of that was generated through social media. And most of those people are like QAnon, which is this, again, an algorithmic cult where they're getting information uh, from crazy sections of like 8chan, 4chan, uh, Parler, which is this crazy app. Um, all of these issues linger over, the, you know, like a radioactive fog right now. It's really, um, <laughs> I can't believe, it just feels like this weight has left everyone's shoulders. I, one of the most refreshing things of the year is when they banned Trump's Twitter. Um, Small thing, and you realize there's everyone has said that the sense of relief came over them when he could not tweet anymore, which I find fascinating. So sorry for these kind of meandering, um, nonlinear approach to respond to your question, but that's that's kind of the way I think. No, I love associations. That's the way that's the way the mind is. <laughs> Let it meander. Um, no, I mean, when I looked at my Twitter today and it said that there's a new administration for POTUS and FLOTUS and everything, it was so nice. <laughs> yeah, and it's hopefully just the beginning. Um, and amusingly enough, like the reason I use that Derridian metaphor of the tain of the mirror and what hold the reflection together is that society is fragile. I mean, democracy is fragile. Um, and democracy and the rhetoric of power, you know, it's been really fascinating. This last four years has been a serious, you know, um, learning lesson in how fragile society is. I think it could have gone in a lot of different directions. Like if those people had found the senators, they could have killed everyone. Um, you would have had an attempted coup d'etat. This would be the first coup d'etat coming out of social media, which it would have been really wild. Um, you know, the algorithmic narrative, again, nobody knows who this Q person is, for example. Although there's a lot of indications that it's just Russian hackers doing crazy stuff. Um, you know, nobody knows. It's the decentered narrative. It was, it's a movement. On one hand, Trump is not necessarily, you know, he's, he's a fool. I mean, I'll just be that clear. I mean, I don't think it's him. I think it's not even the people around him, but it's much more of an algorithmic, you know, almost recommendation engine. Like if you like this fool, you'll like this other fool and you'll keep liking other fools. So how do we break um, that? And that's where I, I, right now I'm fascinated with music's power, culture's power, and democracy is um, a good thing. I mean, I've traveled in many countries and when you're in a country where, you know, authoritarianism or other methods of uh, coercion 
exist, you feel it. I mean, it's a powerful, I've DJed in Sudan, Angola, I've DJed in China. Um, I've been all over the world. I mean, I've been to the North Pole, I've been to Antarctica, the North Pole region, you know, or what they call the Arctic Circle. So all of that, and to go to the heart of some of your questions, the era of our time is like social media has become what the Greeks called the Agora, A-G-O-R-A, um, the public space. And how do we reclaim that? How do we reclaim the commons get people to really uh, focus on a progressive and humanist uh, oriented approach in an era where algorithms, artificial intelligence, and the uncanny are sort of displacing that notion of what is what it means to be human. Yeah, and exactly. Just like the narrative was spun in that direction, people can spin it in other directions as well. I watched like just part of a video with the QAnon shaman, he calls himself, oh, God, with the horns. Yeah. And he was just like on a loop of all the different conspiracies. It was like he had no thought process at all. It was just, he was just like on a complete meme loop. Well, that's what I mean. All of these Trump supporters and the QAnon people, most of the people who were programmed, and I'm literally saying it like there's, they were neuro-linguistically programmed. And once they got there, I don't know if you saw, they're like, what are we supposed to do? What, what, you know, they were just told, go, go, go to the Capitol. Again, my motto is these are like neuro-linguistic zombies. And like you're saying, the guy had the QAnon shaman had no particular. He again, they would. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Ghost in the Shell. It's one of my favorite movies. Um, where there's a scene where this guy has all false memories and false associations, and he's been programmed. Uh, what they call ghost hacking uh, in the movie, and he's like, he's like, here's a photograph of my family, and I know where I'm from, and and nothing he said made any sense. He had just been hacked his brain had been hacked um, and memes again, like, or, or like you're saying. So it's just a crazy moment. Like I I'm writing a book about that myself right now. It's called digital fictions, the future of storytelling. And I'm intrigued by these sort of neuro-linguistic frames of reference. Um, it's a pretty serious moment and it's going to get deeper. And the idea of weaponizing this social space, weaponizing this information that can be used to um, create you know, actionable, you know, in, you know, situations, it's going to, I mean, that, I'm sure anybody who was like, push a button, let's have a crowd pop up anywhere in the world, push a button, and have the crowd do what we want. <laughs> it's a puppet master that many people would pay quite a bit of money for. And it's probably, a, um, uh, I'm sure various hackers and or nation state uh, agents uh, were very intrigued to see that. Yeah, I know. I think about sometimes, like, for all the faults of Amazon and Jeff Bezos, I just think about, like, imagine if he was fascist or had these kind of really right-wing leanings, how much damage he could do having as much power as he has. Yeah. So, I mean, and it, this is just the beginning. I mean, I'm sure um, Xi Jinping and Putin were just like, pass the popcorn. Let's sit back and watch this happen. Um, powerful, powerful. I mean... I grew up a couple blocks from there and I'm still, I, everyone here is still in shock that this was so crazy. I mean, you just, uh, you're in Stockholm, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was in Stockholm on 9-11 uh, mm -hmm. because I had an exhibition project at Magazine 3. It's a really good museum. And, um, you know, it was just, you know, you couldn't, again, like the, you have this sense of unbelief. Um, so I was about to go to the airport and I was taking a nap because they, we actually, the exhibition was opening that night and then you go to the airport. You usually fly back from Stockholm to the US early afternoon. You know. <clears throat> and it was just like, you know, we were told all flights canceled, you can't go anywhere. Uh, but the interesting thing is the hotel let us stay for free and Amer they were like Americans can stay. I got trapped in Stockholm for, for a while uh, because they weren't letting any flights happen. And these kind of moments are like a crescendo uh, 9 11 was one of the most uh, media saturated events of the beginning of the 21st century. And now, after four years of the, the Twitter presidency, um, you know, these are all things that as a composer I'm very intrigued by. It feels very science fictional. Um, and it again, like this we're is just the beginning. living in a J.G. Ballard novel. I wouldn't even say J.G. Ballard. <laughs> it's more like more Philip K. Dick um, um, mixed with uh, William Gibson, maybe. What do you think when you think about like 
how when the internet was starting and like where it is now I just remember like in the 90s there was all this like hope of like connectivity and all these things kind of being like everyone's website having equal access and I do appreciate that side of it like the musicians can just put out their music they don't have to go through these kinds of gatekeeper companies and things like that but then of course right. there's this like monitoring aspect and like collecting our information yeah I mean it's all data mining you know again in Hindu culture, to get to infinity, they say it's just uh, what holds up the you know the world holds up this other world, which holds up another universe. And you're like, okay, what holds up the world? And they're like, oh, a turtle. And then they're like, oh, what holds up the turtle? Oh, another turtle. So, <laughs> so my motto in this stuff is it's turtles all the way down. You know, it's infinity. Um, yeah, I mean, the future of the internet is kind of like that metaphor. Um, data centers, fiber optic cables, satellite dishes, um, those are only the mechanisms of transferring human consciousness and attention around. And um, the way that the attention is monetized is also just such a twisted situation. It's, um, I don't know, man, I'm at a crossroads. I mean, I firmly believe that within 20 years or so, if we don't watch it, most people will be you know, kind of in some Black Mirror episode, or perhaps we already are. Black Mirror is one of my favorite, um, uh, you know, shows going right now. Um, but at the end of the day, um, that kind of social media cognitive dissonance, uh, this is the world around me, the sky is blue, you know, I had, you know, I had tea this morning. Um, memory is malleable. And, and so is existence itself. When I say existence, meaning the human um, perception of what is going on, like, again, the Crump, the, sorry, Crump, I mean, I meant to say Trump, but the Trump demographic is de a deep reflection of this. I mean, they're in a delusional um, information rich environment, but they're also getting the wrong information. And that's on, very much on purpose. Um, you know, it's, but the funny thing is if they've been made algorithmically, they can be unmade algorithmically. And that's where I think composers, artists, creatives need to really think of this as um, kind of a, a new kind of approach that is both the a humanist approach to algorithms and the way memes, um, psychological, you know, the tension between context and content and that kind of rupture. Again, you, rupture has a very specific philosophical you know, kind of term and same with psychoanalysis. So these are all things that link, you know, today is, like I said earlier, January 20th. I'm curious to see, um, the pivot, like how we turn the page and all this. It's kind of wild that we're doing an interview just after the inauguration. So I'm intrigued by that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I know in January 6th, I had just finished with my announcements and like came out right when all of those riots were starting. And I just sat glued to the TV for like six hours until like two o'clock in the morning. It was so <laughs> unbelievable. So you watch the riots and don't forget everyone put their social media while they're rioting. And most of these people had no idea of just basic premise of data security or keeping themselves, you know, relatively safe from prosecution because they're like, hey, I'm breaking into the Capitol. Um, <laughs> their name and this woman that was talking about like, I, I'll be your realtor, like advertising herself. Just yeah, like... I mean, but these were normal, I'm using air quotes, normal white Americans uh, who were coming out of a right wing media echo chamber ecosystem. And they are lost. I mean, it's really fascinating to see how deep down that rabbit hole psychologically and emotionally they can go. And I actually think, like I said earlier, these were normal people, firemen, you know, they caught one guy who was uh, a head of a company called Cognizia, which I always chuckle, a cognitive amnesia, Cognizia, which I was like, that's, that's a terrible name for a company. I don't think I'd name my company that, but um, so many of these people were just, just programmed and they had no idea they were like oh i just i mean they were definitely there to murder i felt like and also to capture and again like they were there at the behest of who knows it, trump you know trump is not the main person i mean i don't it's like the wizard of oz you know it's like um yeah that kind of again just like sense of Mm, that guy's not that clever and nor is his social media there's something else going on some additional dimension that's happening yeah absolutely 
um, I want to make sure we get to talk about what you're doing tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks for asking. Um, I am now the editor at large of Brooklyn Rail, which is a very popular magazine in the art world. Um, I started out mainly as a writer and artist and DJing was meant to be a kind of a hobby and it took over. So over the last year and a half, because of the pandemic, music has been not so much happening. Uh, but meanwhile, I'm also a writer and I'm working on my book, Quantopia Symphony, a book and editing this magazine. So the part of the, the again, like earlier I was saying, like I need to, you need to really think about multidimensionality of text. Like for example, this podcast can be a YouTube video, et cetera, et cetera, an animation or you name it. Um, so I'm trying as much as possible to dimensionalize the concept of a magazine. Um, I'm editor at large, I'm not the main editor. The main editor is Fong Bui, he's a great guy. Uh, my contribution is uh, to bring in a little bit more of the science kind of approach to things and climate change and other kinds of uh, different uh, approaches to how people look at um, art and technology and climate change. Those are my three favorite topics. Um, and when I say science, I'm talking like quantum physics, I'm talking genetic engineering, I'm talking architectures, buildings, materials. So tomorrow I'm doing a dialogue about um, kind of resilience and museums. I'm fascinated with museums. Um, and what we're gonna, I'm talking to a really intriguing character named Yoram Roth, Y-O-R-A-M Roth, R-O-T-H. He's an investor who invests in museums. In fact, one of the museums that he's most well known for is Fotografiska in Stockholm. Um, yeah, he's an investor in that. He's an investor in Fotografiska because there's several of them. And he's the principal investor for that. He also um, has the Jewish Museum in Berlin that he, he's a partner there. So we're gonna be talking about what it means to think about museums in multinational or international um, curation and processes. When I say curation, I don't mean just physical space because curators will usually say, okay, let's put a painting in this one show, or whatever, they'll be running around doing that. I was, want as much as possible to rethink this idea of dematerialization um, a lot of theoreticians are saying that you only stand in front of a painting so long, or they'll study and measure that. Um, or you only go through a museum as what they call processional, like you walk. Well, I'm sorry, the sun just is coming out there. It's kind of funny, today's been a strange day, like a lot of clouds. Um, there, there we go. Sorry, I'm sitting in a seat with wheels. So, um, yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. And we're, we're also working with a really wonderful architect named uh, uh, Mitchell Joachim. And he is the principal architect of a company called Terraform One. Um, that means Open Network Ecology, O-N-E. So we're going to be having a conversation as part of the series. And the main premise of the conversation is what is resilience and how do museums help us kind of philosophically and lyrically and above all architecturally rethink the urban landscape. Now, New York is hemorrhaging people right now. Millions of people have left the city. So too is San Francisco. Most major metropol uh, metropolitan areas are experiencing a lot of flux right now because people are leaving cities. Um, and that's reversing a trend of several centuries of urban you know, consolidation. So urban sprawl is gonna be an issue people telecommuting uh, to work, but also you go to a museum to kind of pull out of the normal everyday ebb and flow. Um, and museums to me at least have become kind of what I call a mausoleum of culture. So these are all things to kind of rethink and that's what the di discussion's about tomorrow. Very cool. And I'll link to that as well so people can sign up. And okay, it's free. Yeah, it's free. Mm -hmm. Anything yeah. else going on? I saw you're doing something with the Ginsburg Foundation as well. Yeah, um, and I'm, I'm a producer on this project, uh, The Fall of America. Uh, it's a collection of his poems. I have it right here, one second. It's funny, you know, I'm writing, a, when I'm working on a book, I have the books that I'm reading and things. You know what, I'll, I'll give you a quick tour. So this is my mnemonic system. Uh, what it. I'm doing is all of these books are part of my references and I have them in a way that I can kind of visually reference them while I'm writing and then oh yeah I need to think about that and I'll physically normally I've gotten to digital books but um 
lately I've been much more inclined to um, get the physical book and have it on hand and open it to the pages and reference points that I want. Um, I also collect quite a bit of records. This is just a, what you're seeing here is just reference. These are reference materials. Um, and I've gone mostly digital. So they're, all these are gathering dust at this point, but this is a loft in New York where I do my writing and then I travel. Um, usually, air quotes, I'm normally traveling a lot. Uh, yeah, so that's it in a nutshell. Um, yeah, the book and the, um, the discussions, um, The Fall of America was an epic poem that Allen Ginsberg wrote, you know, looking at the uh, political and cultural crisis of the 1960s. And he was commissioned by Bob Dylan to write a series of poems about this radical transformation of American society. Um, and these are all issues that we really um, can see are very much part of the everyday conversation. You know, I really, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Ginsburg and the beat poets in general, of course, and the beat writers, uh, William S. Burroughs, Jack Kerouac, Amiri Baraka, and Allen Ginsberg, and there's others as well. But those guys really helped open up the narrative for stream of consciousness narrative. And I'm very interested in that. Yeah, me too. Exactly. That's why I, I wrote about the parallels with psychoanalysis and that I find myself, I, I, I'll like do a conference or something. Or I wrote a book on like violence and systemic violence and really heavy stuff in that way. And then I go and back into art. I seem to go back and forth between like political and art, which of course go together well. <laughs> yeah. Well, art is a reflection of its time. I mean, I feel like we're right at the edge of what the Germans would have called the Weimar Republic uh, in the 1920s when Hitler tried to do this, what they call beer hall putsch. Um, but at the same time, they had an incredible flowering of culture. One of my all time favorite composers is Hans Eisler and his musical compositions for um, Bertolt Brecht's Three Penny Opera, for example. Um, these kind of things, again, linger over the conversation. Uh, in a beautiful and interesting way. And I also saw that you're the artist in residence at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology this year. Yeah, um, I'm all, I'm very much, like New York has its kind of quirky, there's certain protocols in New York that I find very stifling. So I tend to do a lot of stuff internationally. Uh, this year I'm artist in residence at the Norwegian Institute of Technology. But again, you can't go because of the um, you know, it's just the way it is. Yeah, and uh, the pandemic being what it is, you just can't, you know, the world, it's, I miss travel. <laughs> I'll just keep it short there, I miss travel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm supposed to be in Trondheim, uh, Norway at the moment. It's warmer here, but, you know. Trondheim's nice. Yeah, maybe I, after this. Yeah, I've been there. Have you been? Have you spent much time there? Yeah. Okay. Is well, there anything else you wanted to be sure to mention? I know you only have limited time. You know, at the moment, the book, uh, Quantopia. Okay, so my book is called Digital Fictions. That'll be out probably late this year, early next year. Um, Quantopia is a kind of, it's a project that's ongoing and I'm in the, I'm fine tuning it, getting a lot of stuff together. Um, uh, those are two, uh, yeah, uh, I'm producing this project, uh, Allen Ginsberg's estate, the fall of America. Um, God, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of other projects. <laughs> yeah, those are the three that are top priority, like uh, the Ginsburg Project, Quantopia, and the, my book, uh, Digital Fictions, The Future of Storytelling. Um, I'm also finishing the second edition of my Antarctica project um, as well. So yeah, these are all things that are part of the basic uh, fabric of what's happening. It's amazing you've been to Antarctica. It's a crazy moment, man, I tell you. Um, Antarctica probably won't be there much longer, <laughs> or at least in the state, the state that I left it in uh, a couple of years ago is a whole different, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, uh, climate change is accelerating at every level, basically. So that is that.
Yeah. Um, and so that's, yeah, I'm generally during the afternoons, I'm sitting here writing and then I go jogging. That's my everyday uh, pandemic uh, creative moment. Yeah, and I'll link to your website and, and the newsletter. People can sign up for your newsletter and stay on top of everything you're doing that way. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm, I'm reading your book generally in the evenings. During the afternoons, I've been writing. I just got the PDF, thank you, a couple of days ago. Um, so it's, it's in my um, reading uh, flow, but I, I just need a little more time to process everything. So far, I love the Scansian idea. I, um, I'm surprised. There's certain terms like, um, you know, scansion or, um, you know, just uh, people who are fascinated with ideas, uh, but we sometimes lack the language or the vocabulary, um, you know, and there's certain words like, uh, you know, sesquipedalian, which I've never exactly pronounced right. It means a love for long words or another term desuetude, which means um, obsolete, obsolete. Um, there's, and scansion is one of those kind of words where you're like, what is scansion again? What is that? Um, it's familiar enough that it's right at the edge of being familiar, but it's not, you know, the, pre the precise definition is all, it's like reading of lines and theories in between the lines and so on, uh, which is a nice term for our moment. So great. It's a fun title. It is a nice term for our moment. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's so nice to get to talk to you. I've been listening to your music since the 90s, so it's a real treat for me. I'm honored. Thank you. Um, at the moment, it's a weird, you know, I just feel like everything is floating in limbo. And today with this inauguration, you, this weight has left your shoulders. So it's, it's been a very dark time in American, con you know, it's really twisted. And I'm so glad that Trump is gone. It's an eerie moment and it's, and the good news is I'm filled with optimism. I definitely think that their humanity can um, always begin. We're very resilient, you know, it's a crazy thing to say. I, I'm an optimist who's a, a cynical optimist. That's my nickname for it all. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very beautiful day to do an interview like this. It's um, both hopeful and optimistic and I just took a long 30 minute walk and was listening to the inauguration on my headphones and it put me in a good mood, which, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's good. It's well, well needed. Cynical optimist. I like that. Yeah. I mean, there's naive optimism, then there's cynical realism, but uh, cynical optimism, that's kind of me at the moment. Yeah. Because people are really resilient. I think they are. I believe they are. I, I like to think that my fellow human being can kind of rise to the occasion. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Paul D. Miller, also known as DJ Spooky, that subliminal kid. For more, please visit his website, djspooky.com, and sign up for his newsletter. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l your support is greatly appreciated for more information you can also visit my website dr vanessa sinclair dot net or the podcast main website rendering unconscious dot org.